The late 80s were a monumental time for video game development, and every company that had anything to do with digital media was trying to grab as much of the home gaming market as they could. Nintendo's first party development staff was busy shaping the gaming market that we know today with entries like The Legend of Zelda and Metroid, while developers such as Tecmo and Konami were trying to figure out new ways for audiences to go on big adventures or experience their favorite arcade hits at home. Mega Man was developed specifically as a step towards Capcom cementing themselves in the Japanese home gaming market, branching away from arcade titles and their respective home ports. Breaking away from the linear format of most home console adventures, Mega Man hosted one of the first uses of a level select screen, allowing players to approach the game's stages in whichever order they saw fit. This early change in form is seen as a predecessor to optional objectives and side quests in large-scale adventure games later down the line. The first Mega Man game was well received by critics but sold poorly, especially in North America. However, several reviewers praised the visuals, music, as well as innovative, near-perfect gameplay, despite its infamous difficulty, and eventually Mega Man went on to be considered a staple of the NES library. As time went on, this sleeper hit went on to spawn five more sequels on the same console, alongside plenty more entries for years to come. Let's discover how Capcom proved their home gaming prowess as we piece together what's so great about Mega Man. In the plot of Mega Man, Dr. Wright, known as Dr. Light in future entries, along with the help of his assistant, Dr. Wily, created a set of humanoid robots to perform dangerous tasks, such as construction or resource procurement. The first creation by this duo, Mega Man, turned out fine, but then Dr. Wily reprogrammed the other six robots for his own plans at world domination. Mega Man, able to resist reprogramming, has set off to defeat the six robot servants of Dr. Wily and then the mad scientist himself. Supposing the player does absolutely nothing other than hit start from when the game boots up, they'll find themselves on Cut Man's stage, so it's easy to look at this one like an introductory course. It's not specifically easier than the others to my knowledge, but nearly each screen near the beginning of the level has something to teach the player. The first screen introduces the player to how they'll navigate obstacles in the world. There are a few obvious stone blocks that you could jump up, but the gap at the top is too narrow for Mega Man, forcing the player to take the ladder instead. This may not seem like much, but even getting around the environment through any means other than left or right movement was pretty new to the NES at the time. Without scrolling the screen, this still introduces the player to the concept of vertical movement, which is very important in the Mega Man universe. Soon after beginning Cutman's stage, you'll actually be jumped by your first adversary, much more aggressively than you would in Super Mario Bros., for instance. And to make matters worse, this enemy is smart enough to chase you. Confronted with a taste of the difficulty that awaits in this game, players have to react quickly and attempt to either defeat the enemy or flee. Luckily, if this foe moves off screen, it may despawn and no longer be a threat. Moving forward, you'll be attacked by two more floating foes, so that no matter whether you attempt to take the higher or lower path, you'll have an easy shot at one, but have to navigate around the other to avoid taking damage. After these flying enemies, there will be stationary cannons that fire in multiple preset directions. These obstacles and the vertical environment we find them in quickly force the player to learn a new style of puzzle, much more in tune with timing your movements rather than dodging or shooting. These turrets can still be destroyed if the player can reach them, and there's actually a good little opportunity to realize that you can shoot horizontally while climbing ladders. It's pretty unique at this time to be able to fall down pits under certain circumstances and not immediately lose a life, as you could expect in most platformer games out there. Not only can you climb ladders back and forth between certain screens in Mega Man, but if you're in a vertical segment, you may very well fall between screens in a smoother manner than had been seen in many games at this time. The hallway leading to Cutman is a nice daunting buildup, leading to a close quarters brawl with our first boss. Luckily, Cutman's attack also follows some pretty basic guidelines that make facing him easy to learn but difficult to master. He moves at the exact same pace as Mega Man and is the same size, so the player has a good frame of reference to how they can expect Cutman to maneuver. Otherwise, his only attack is to throw the blade on his head, which flies in a straight pattern until it hits the edge of the screen, then takes the shortest path back to Cutman. Once this pattern is observed, really all the player has to do is dodge it and hit him in between attacks. But the fact that it's easier said than done is where the challenge really comes from. 
The tight room and the lack of additional defenses in the face of overwhelming offense means there's nothing for the player to do other than get good enough at the game to beat this foe. Worst case scenario, they could also give up on this stage for now and try to take on a different level from the start of the game. Mega Man as a game had a unique approach to level design, shying away from many of the traditional formats of games in that era, and opting in for a presentation that allowed more action that was challenging yet fair. Instead of the usual scrolling mechanics of Super Mario Bros. or Kid Icarus, more complex platforming arrangements in Mega Man loaded one screen at a time, setting limits on what the player needed to pay attention to as well as what they were capable of. There were also no running jumps like you could expect out of Mario, and you couldn't float nimbly between enemies like in Mighty Bomb Jack. The majority of the threats in Mega Man relied instead on timing and accuracy. While there are typical run and gun segments, the majority of Mega Man's most notable gameplay comes from being locked into one screen worth of space and being presented with a challenge of either platforming or combat prowess. And this also formed a basis for Mega Man's notorious boss fight format, which felt a lot more skill-based than facing an enemy in Castlevania or Metroid, where the amount of upgrades and ammunition you have make a significant difference in how easy or downright possible a boss is. In Mega Man, all of the bosses are challenging, but they follow the majority of the same roles that you do. Sure, they have unique attacks that have much more versatility than our protagonist's pea shooter, but they don't take up half the screen, fly around unpredictably, or just stand there taking hits while unloading their own attacks toward the player. They move with a very similar sensation to Mega Man himself, following the rules of this established universe to provide players with a fair challenge. Beyond the natural abilities of each character, there is a minor element of rock, paper, scissors at play. Many of the bosses are actually weak to the ability of another. It may be rough to make it all the way to a boss only to lose, but you may find out that the abilities at your disposal will make other stages much easier to tackle first, until you discover which abilities are best for each boss. And this is also one of the earliest action platformers to give enemies health bars. While if you were taking on Bowser or Ridley in other Nintendo games, you just have to keep blasting until they were gone. In Mega Man, at least you know how much progress you're making. Designing the stages around unique bosses who all worked in specific environments or had obvious themes really helped in keeping things visually interesting in Mega Man as well. In most NES games of the time, the setting of the game would be the majority of what you were going to be seeing, but in Mega Man we got all sorts of different colors and shapes in the level designs to shake things up a bit and add even more character to the world around us. After defeating a Robot Master, you'll collect a new ability from them which comes with its own ammunition bar, which can be seen near Mega Man's health and replenished from items that regular enemies will drop. Mega Man also changes color to match that specific boss's theme and make it more obvious which power the player has equipped. A lot of the threats in the Mega Man games, especially the first one, really just come down to recognizing the pattern and either avoiding or attacking the source of the threat whenever it's safe. If the player feels like it, this could actually be a slower and more methodical game than Super Mario Bros., seeing as there's no timer and even when you fall in many areas, the penalty is just to try again. Mega Man also managed to make pixel-perfect jumps a fair challenge. In more poorly programmed games, even those released years or decades after the first Mega Man, platforming can become unbearable if everything feels either too loose or too tight. Mega Man is one of the only games in which your character is locked into a single pace even when in the air, yet performs jumps as expected, not landing too shy of the target, sliding, or floating off course. This is one of the reasons the old Mega Man games stood out so much in the NES era, because platformer games for years would still have trouble getting the sensation of moving and jumping right on such limited displays. The majority of the time, developers either gave you a running mechanic like in Super Mario Bros., or another mechanic to make jumping easier, such as Kirby's float or Samus's space boots. If a game couldn't get that sensation of jumping just right, or provide a way to make it fit the game's expectations, then platforming could very easily wind up a frustrating, game-ending mess. Sometimes, it is simply too difficult to avoid certain obstacles without taking damage. That's actually what sets Mega Man apart as an enjoyably difficult action platformer, as opposed to the Super Mario Bros. or Kirby games which are a lot more casual. There are far more threats in the Mega Man games, and it means that you're probably going to have a rough time beating it, but that's all the motivation to get better at navigating certain obstacles and defeating certain enemies. The better you are at the conceivably doable parts, the more forgiving you can be with yourself on the brutal parts that you just have to push through. 
Rather than detriments to your enjoyment, the hits you take in Mega Man feel like scrapes and bruises that can be expected along any difficult journey. All of the enemy variations are really impressive for such an early NES game as well. The enemies are pretty unique and easily identifiable as to which stage they're from and how they attack the player. There are enemies who pursue you, some who just follow their own strict pattern, and some who only react when you get near them. This makes even the low-level threats more interesting than just differently colored blobs that run into you. As you begin to understand how each type of enemy moves, you get better and better at avoiding them, just like in Castlevania. Due to the fact that enemies respawn if you leave the screen, it's never a good idea to retreat, forcing players to face their enemies and learn how to progress quickly. This may seem like a real detriment to the convenience of the player, but these respawning foes can also be used to collect bonus lives and health boosts should you need a pick-me-up before heading on to a more dangerous point in the level. There are plenty of health items that already exist in a level for the player to grab without facing enemies, but these are often guarded by environmental threats to deter the player. This means that as long as the player has been doing well and hasn't lost too much health, then they don't have to risk the threat at all. But if they're struggling to get by, that all or nothing risk may be worth it. Mega Man was one of the earliest instances of a game managing the balance of both movement and combat in an enjoyable manner. Often, one would have to be sacrificed for the other. In Mega Man, enemies of all sorts of speeds and sizes don't plow through you like in Ghosts and Goblins or Rygar, and you aren't necessarily better off avoiding them, like you are in Balloon Fight or Kid Icarus. Action games were still a fledgling concept in the world of gaming at this time, as arcade game shooters ceased to be the end-all be-all of digital entertainment. What Mega Man did, put into plain words, would be to make a fun, challenging game that felt good to play. Along with many of the other comments I've made throughout this video, one major difference from many games of this era is the fact that the hitboxes in Mega Man are incredibly clean. You can just easily understand where everything is and how it all fits together. You can expect certain projectiles to hit you, or for Mega Man to be able to land a specific jump, because the world and its dangerous inhabitants all follow such clean guidelines. This first game in the series is absolutely not a walk in the park, especially due to the missing feature of any way to heal yourself before or during a difficult point of the game. But it's by no means any more ridiculous an expectation than beating most any game to be released in the first couple years of the NES's lifespan. While still requiring a good deal of player skill in order to master, this game constructed a world where their protagonist, enemies, weapons, environments, and threats all fit together not only stylistically, but in terms of gameplay too, creating one of the greatest action experiences that would be seen in home markets for quite some time. That is what's so great about Mega Man. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of What's So Great About Gaming, as we inspected the original Mega Man. Want to see some bonus content? Maybe support the creation of these videos? If so, check out the What's So Great Discord, Twitch, or Patreon. Links for all of those are in the description. If you want to hear what's great about another game, check out the link to our last episode, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, on screen or in the description. And please take the time to subscribe to be involved in the discussions here. Thanks again for watching. Now go play a great game. We'll see you next time.